Okay. Uh, I will share my screen. Uh, let's stop one. Here we go. So can you see my screen? Yes, okay. So um, recently I'm working with Jacob on a project. Uh, before I start, I will try to recall the problem statement a little bit. So basically when we are working with Gilly and Jacob only have a really great effort on the back object catch, uh, we observe that uh, that project is, doesn't yield a good result as we expected. And we, when we continue to explore why, we realize that uh, CBC now became a bottleneck for Gitly when serving this uh, fetch traffic. So basically, somehow Gitly spent a lot of a chunks of effort to not send in stuff, but instead it do something out well behind the scene. So uh, that's why Jacob think that uh, it is really uh, great for us to just work with the plan TCB socket and so that we can utilize the network, the CTB utilization as well as the other thing else. But it is not very wise for us to implement a whole new Gitly replacement because we already uh, invested a lot of efforts into Gitly and Gitly has a tons of interceptor middleware which is very useful for us. It is very wise for us to implement a whole new server. So that's why we come up with a thing, a, a mechanism to so that we can reduce our, our reason the uh, Gitly server why we can still use like the this raw TCB socket. And we call that thing, um, let's say stream RBC. No, not uh, ZBC replacement. It's just like a, a hack for us to uh, still- Yeah, but you mentioned, that, you mentioned at some point Gitly replacement and that, yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> so basically we just try to replace ZBC for the git fetching uh, operations, that's it. And we come up with a thing called stream RBC. So it's how stream RPC work. Uh, okay, where is it? So, okay, I brought a flow chart for us to easily understand how the flow works over, in overview. So basically uh, when our client want to query something in the git storage, we will call an uh, RPC uh, request to get this server. And the way it is that uh, it's do is to establish a TCB handshake with the Gilly server. And when the Gilly server uh, already established a connection, Gilly server will try to delegate to a module called the Gilly listeners so that uh, it can establish, continue establish the TOS handshake with the credential. So basically, uh, when we establish a raw in secure connection to Gilly server, we don't need this one, but uh, we are trying to inject our own uh, multiplexer into. So I will show you uh, how it works. So basically, we uh, is the Git the code for the Gitly server main uh, server. So when we create a new server in Gitly, we are uh, putting a lot of server option, the stream interceptor, the unary interceptor, and one important thing is that uh, CBC allow us to inject our own hand shaking handler inside. So we implement our own uh, hand shaking handler called the listeners one. So this one, it uh, is it up doing the normal TOS hand shaking. We just uh, try to make it a uh, multiplexer. So back to the story. And so when our client try to make a new uh, a, a con, we will try to inject a new uh, um, like a magic bike, a stream of magic bike into the TCP connection called the stream RBC zero or zero. Then our Gitly listener will try to classify multiplex. The connection beyond that, it can pick either back channel or stream RBC or just resume the normal flow. So if the magic bar is stream RBC 00, it delegate to our stream RBC server to handle the stream. And after work, the client will try to compose a handshaking request to send to the server. So the request include three elements. The first one is the method, which is the, in this case, the test stream for us to test anyway. And the second one is the metadata. It will be in the authentication or the context or anything we want to pass to the server. And finally, the message corresponding to the ZFC method here. And uh, the uh, stream RBC hand shaking, uh, we write into the Y with the LAN prefix uh, format so that we write the by first and then the home payload, Marshall payload later. And then our stream RBC server will try to ver um, unwrap the handshaking request and 
uh, look up and verify. And finally, when it accepts the connection, we will try to write uh, uh, some bytes back to notify the client that it accepts the connection. And afterward, it will invoke the real um, CIBC handler and the hot interceptors of the server. So the uh, CIBC handler will try to interact with the client via draw TCP connection right here. And so that's why we can, uh, the handler can just write directly into the TCP connection. And it is not possible with the normal CIBC flow. And when the connection, uh, the, the handler finished its operation, like the the horn um, backfire back to the client, it will close the connections. And then the our uh, Gitterly listener, we try to notify the Gitterly server, the horn flow is done and it doesn't need to resume the normal flow. So that is it's a really simple flow. So basically our Gitterly uh, stream RBC server, we try to steal the job from the Gitterly server and try to do something behind its back so that it uh, the handler can uh, use the raw TCP connection. And that's how we can just uh, make the stream RBC server work alongside with the Gitterly server in the same binding uh, listening connection, uh, listening binding. And uh, we can reduce the haunt interceptor stack of Gitterly server like uh, logging, matrix authentication, and so on. So that's how uh, how it works. Um, any questions so far? Where does the communication uh, to, because you mentioned at some point that the authorization and so on gets passed on to the new stream RPC server. Does yep. that uh, stream RPC server handle asking GitLab Rails uh, for access and so on, or does yes, it yes, it does. Ah, yeah, okay. So, uh, okay, I will show the code as well. So, when we initialize the CIBC server, we also uh, pass the horn uh, interceptor chain into that server. It's not like the uh, replication, so that the stream RBC server is not a uh, uh, CIBC server, but it just go through the horn stack of interceptor and ask uh, if it is a CIBC server. So we can reuse everything without, well, uh, re-implementing them. Okay, uh, I will continue. So this is just the um, story between the client and the Gitterly server. How about if we put the graphic into the picture, how it would fit? So uh, we haven't uh, finalized the solution yet because the job is uh, on the holiday, but uh, uh, and move forward a little bit and implement a proper concept stream MC proxy to plug into Graphite. So how it work is, is nearly the same. So basically when the client try to, okay, I zoom a little bit, oh, oops, where is it? So when the client try to uh, implement a connection, uh, establish a connection to the Graphite server, it still do the DSP handshake again and Similarly, we inject the graphic listener into the graphic server. So, and do the same magic by stuff. And then the um, stream RPC proxy will try to intercept, intercept the handshake message. And uh, this time, the handshake message will include the repository, which is required for on RPC request to Gitly. And uh, after that, the stream RPC proxy try to read and wrap the message to look up and then look up the GBC method responsible for the one we passing. And then it will try to unmeasure the stream of request here and try to try extract the target variable responsibility from the header. So basically we, we work the same as what we are doing with Profit with this US router to store the, um, to, to find the, the Gitly server corresponding for a target variable. And after it can find the target node, we will establish the second stream RBC con to the target node. And when the target node accepts the connection, we signal the client to start the streaming process. And then we act as the proxy in between to stream the input part and forward the output part from the client and the uh, Gitly server. And after that, we still keep and continue. So that's how our uh, stream RBC proxy works with profit. And AI static is work quite well with the haunt, uh, login, metrics, and authentication. 
So that's it. I just want to have like an overview about how stream up C works underlying. Awesome. Thank you. So any questions about that? How are we going to start rolling this out? Is like, yeah, is there a plan for that? Like, uh, how are we going to, for example, feature flag that? Yeah, it's the hard question. So basically, when we are trying to inject our stream obviously into Gitterly, it will not be very easy. However, because the whole stream obviously concept is new, it uh after we run it out, there is nothing change with Gitterly server on the normal act operation we stopped as before and then we have uh, Im implemented a test stream a state rbc to test out all the feature we need from stream rbc protocol on the version and after that we continue with uh boss uh, uh boss upload back and ssh uh, upload back rbc with the new protocol so we will we'll try to run out uh up each rbc one by one but there has like, is there a way to scope this, like uh, to scope this to projects, servers, like, yeah. Yeah, uh, we haven't figured out, but I think we can uh, just eliminate some kind of a feature flag to enable that the uh, stream RBC protocol for a particular repository. I think that's one issue that we need to add into that project is building out how we will roll it out. Mm, yes, yes, I think we should put that into the project. So it's on for me. There isn't any other item in the agenda. Does anybody want to see a new Redis instance doing almost nothing, but something? I think yes, it's extremely awesome. satisfying. <laughs> uh, I've been seeing the anomaly alerts all day. Yeah. Sh sh uh. <laughs> It's should fine. Just, it's like, it's a good thing. Should I just silence them or? No, I mean, I'm, I thought I was the only one that looked at that channel. So no, I knew I, I when I turned it on, I said like, yeah, uh, the, those, wait, let's, let's look at the dashboard because that shows it as well. Uh, we actually need to just redeploy um, Slack line because it's not giving the, um, it doesn't know about the service because it gets deployed with the service catalog. Um, but that's the simple thing. Uh, deployed with the service catalog. Yeah, it just that takes the YAML file and, and, and deploys it as part of Slackline. And so when it sees a new service like this, it doesn't give the dashboards and stuff because it doesn't know what it is. Um, so but nothing, the service has been out for a while. But yeah, yeah the fact that Slackline hasn't been deployed is, very often. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the reason that we're getting alerts is because the yellow line is not in the green lines as it should be because, well, this instance has been around for a while doing nothing, and now it's doing very little, but something. Yeah, I and think 150 RPS is the lowest for any Redis server that I've ever seen, but a uh, good start. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that's what I, what I thought was funny, like, because it comes from doing nothing, like really nothing, and then we throw some work at it, and this, well, where is the saturation wrong? Because this this um, service is already provisioned to take the entire load of the um, trace chunks, so that means that right now it's like really bored, and I think it's funny. Yeah. At the moment, it's only got four four projects in it, right? Uh, what did I enable? The project that I was working on, the Fluent D thing, uh, Runbooks, uh, the website, and uh, GitLab or GitLab. So four projects and only two busy ones. So what's the next step for getting more projects? 
I was going to come comment that on the rollout issue. I think now we should uh, begin. No, I think we should leave this running at least 24 hours, see that nothing blows up, and then um, start roll a percentage based rollout on actors, I think. So yeah, that's some projects start moving towards that. We wouldn't need to have 24 hours between the sub subsequent rollouts. Like if we left it for 24 hours, that means this time tomorrow, tomorrow, we could start the percentage based and then be um, at 100%. I think, I think maybe 24 hours is a little bit an exaggeration. I think Craig could start maybe with the next percentage rollout and leave a note for somebody else to do the next step tomorrow. So we go in 12 hour steps rolling this so out. So we could potentially be, be finished by the end of tomorrow. I prefer mm -hmm. if Craig answered that because I don't know uh, what this server is going to do when we throw all of the work at it. And I don't think he knows it. That's why we're doing it gradually. And if we see that, yeah, we might have like maybe it's too, well, if it's too big, it's fine, but maybe it's too small <laughs> or yeah, well, who knows. Well, if he's able to continue over, if he's able to continue uh, later today, and then hopefully you can pick it up again tomorrow, we can see how far we get by the end of tomorrow. I'll comment on that issue, yeah. So I have a question that is more of a philosophical discussion than a technical one. What would increase our confidence? You're like, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and Craig is also unsure, so, no, I don't think Craig is unsure. I think uh, Craig knows more, and I'm a little bit like I'm. I'm Craig is the owner about this. What? Craig is the owner slash DRI, so you don't want to answer. You don't want to answer on his behalf. Uh, and he is also it? spun up this server, like the he spun up this shard without me like knowing what's in there. I just watch graphs go up after I did something with feature flags. So um, I'm pretty confident that it's fine because now it's not doing anything. So I wouldn't mind starting a percentage based rollout, but I'd prefer to have an SRE sign off on that and Craig's the SRE that knows about it. So the reason why I'm asking is you have a time zone advantage. So if you run something now and you have a level of confidence right, with the data that is provided to you by Craig, then wouldn't it be better to think about, you know, we have a way forward and way backwards. That's what I'm understanding, right? That's, like we... uh, that's basically what we did. Craig rolled this out, tested it on staging. End of day, he said, I, this is where I got somebody else. Please roll out for these projects. That's what we did now. And now I'm going to mention to Craig, you carry it further. And then I think I will pick it up again tomorrow to yeah, pick up where Craig left off tonight. Okay. Or are you suggesting that we go faster? So I'm not suggesting we should go faster or slower. I'm asking where is our level of confidence, right? Like if we have all the metrics that we think we need right now, if we have all the controls we have, right? Like turning things on or turning things off. If we have run the experiment on a smaller subset of projects and we got the results we expected, what is our, like what other confidence we need to gain um, to be able to, well, either like change our um, tactics or, you know, continue with it. Like what, what is the confirmation we are asking or waiting for? Uh, right now, the confirmation that we got from this is that everything is fine. What we, what I don't know, but Craig probably does is how many projects do we add now? Okay. Like what's the, like how big is the next step? Because yeah, we could do. We don't have that in a rollout plan. Um, we uh, not, no, not that I know. Okay. Cool, thanks. Good point though, I'll, um, I'm taking a look in that, that, I'm taking a look in that issue to see if it's written down.
But the way I'm, I'm thinking about these general things is if I have a certain level of confidence and even if I'm the DRI and I offloaded something to someone, right? Like I gave a task to someone and everything is going fine. Wouldn't I want to get more work done by my shift time so I can actually just either complete things or have that data set, larger data set than just my shift? I probably would like to have that time, like that running time, and that might actually give me more details because what I'm thinking about, I'm not speaking incredibly half, but I'm thinking about other situations. The general concern when things are being rolled out in APEC zones is low traffic, right? Like we don't have enough traffic, we need to wait, we need to gather the data. And if we are doing this, if we are already confident and we have all the bells and whistles and we have all the controls, maybe that data collection can happen now um, so that when cracks come, comes in, and if we have like the details of how we are rolling this out, there might not need to be a wait time in between. Um, looking at this, what I've seen now, I wouldn't be opposed to just enabling for 1% of projects in total, but um, yeah, I don't know if there's another reason that Craig wanted to wait in the issue. There wasn't a description and he just left a note in the, the project channel as a handover where he got and I thought that it would be fun to continue. So that's what we did. Well, if we're not seeing any negative side effects, um, maybe we should just go for 1% of projects. Um, and then he's got a few more hours of data before he comes on. I think that's not a bad idea because as I sh I've shown, that server is really bored. Let's make the server happy and give it more to do. Thanks, Bob. Welcome. Well, would anyone like to see some SciSense dashboards about error yes. budgets? Yes. Do we finally have data source in SciSense? Oh, yes, we finally have a data source Excellent. in SciSense. So that's going to uh, open up a lot of doors, by the way. It does. Well, we are. It, it is. Um, well, I think you might hmm. <laughs> talk to me after the recording. So um, where I've started with this is I started with just doing the work for two sections um, so that we could provide them back to product and they can give us feedback before I go ahead and do this for all the other sections, because there is an awful lot of copy paste in producing these things and I don't want to have to change what I'm copying and pasting across everything. So when they first come in here, this is the overview showing all sections in development and the availability for all sections taken as an end of month reading for June and as far as we are currently in July. And then it is broken down by section. So this is everything that is in uh, every group that is in every stage in the dev section and the same for ops. And I've split it down into two views showing the availability versus the target and the budget spent versus the target. Uh, so if we go into one of the dashboards here uh, for the dev section, I've then broken that down for each of the stages. Yes, each of the stages. So there's manage, plan, and create, doing the same thing, showing the availability and the, and the minutes spent. Um, I stopped there because we do also have the minutes remaining, but I want to have them come back and say that that's what they'd like to see before going and making those changes everywhere. Uh, and then providing the links to the Grafana dashboards at the bottom. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really sort of simple view of of the error budgets, but it's what we were, it's what they asked to see inside of SciSense. And what's quite nice over here is this is the one that they can use as the performance indicator if they so choose to, because that's also what they wanted to see, um, because that sums up absolutely everything. Um, we have had a request to be able to break this information down even further, like to the controller level, so that an engineering manager might be able to go in and say, well, we did work on controller X and we want to see the change um, um, month on month. Um, but we aren't pulling the data in in that level of detail yet. So um, 
that's not going yeah. to be an easy one to do. Like we don't, um, like it's not rolled up in like the that. metrics neither. Like uh, the moment you, the moment we are um, working with group level metrics and no longer feature category metrics, we don't have the detail of the endpoint anymore. Yeah, so I think what I'm going to do is just describe to them how they can do the same thing using the using the existing links that they've already got and just adjusting the filters. Um, but in terms of what we what we were asked to produce, this is a, a decent first iteration towards that. And they can see how the target is way up there and lots of things aren't quite up there right now. So, Speaking of um, that, uh, is there a way of tweaking the y-axis? Because it kind of looks like configure has almost zero availability, but it's actually at 98.9. Yeah, so you we can tweak that, but um, the problem was over here. So where you've got something that's got a really high availability, suddenly it gets really, really close to this line and you can't see that it's still below. So it felt mm -hmm. like this was the best view I could come up with to still show that it's not quite there, unless I make the chart way bigger. Yeah, I was wondering if we could reframe it so it's the other way around. So uh, what's the opposite of availability? Um, kind of error Static rates. type view. Yeah, so the, um, well, no, actually I wasn't thinking of, of upside that's down the, charts. I was just thinking of a chart that's, that's where the target is 0 0.05, uh, 0, 0.0, whatever it is. And oh, um, yeah. So just one minus all those values. But that's just the different axes on the on the bottom charts in the end. Uh, yes, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's the same shape as the bottom charts, but a different axis. But I don't know. I feel like that kind of makes it look worse than it is because it looks like configure. If you just look at the I mean, chart, I mean, to me, it looks like about 10, 20 percent, uh, which would be really bad, but it's not. Is it is it the availability minus or is it one minus? It's it's the it's the target minus, right? Uh, the budget minutes spent is target minus. I was talking about one minus, but as the target is so close to one, it would be pretty similar. Yeah, yeah. It's, until I get uh, better. Yeah, <laughs> Rachel. This is the like for each group. This is the average uh, rolled up. Like um, for the average of all groups is a stage. Is that uh, how it goes? Do you mean in this this chart at the top, or which chart are you? Um, yes, the chart at the top that shows um, the right. So, like, for instance, rate has like three or four groups inside it. Yes, so it is the average for that currently. So the last reading that we have for each of those take the average of the three. Could you share the query? Because if we have access to the underlying, do we have access to the underlying operation count here, Bob? Do you know? Not the no. operation count, no. Okay, so we can't wait it um, and get the, the correct value. That's fine. I was just, I was just, I was just uh, no, no, like, um, yeah. We cool. don't so have that if you have a stage with two groups and one group does 10 operations and they all fail and the other group does a thousand operations and they all succeed, this would show 50% because it's the average of the groups, not the average of the operations because we don't have the operations there. I think that's an unlikely example. I'm just giving an example. Um, I think it would be, I think these things would be much easier to do with just the metrics and have people mm. look at Grafana instead. <laughs> <laughs> I did feel a lot like I was recreating Grafana with quite a lot of these things. Um, yeah, so, okay, I mean... What is the goal, right? Like, the goal is to have product managers able to review on a quick overview what is happening within their stage. Do we expect them to understand every single aspect no, on this dashboard? That... So Rachel, sorry, if you go back to the drill down of the, that one, that was what I was going to ask. Yeah, so that, that would show you um, here if there was a discrepancy, like, you know, it would show you that, okay, package is actually kind of pretty much, package and monitor are actually, you know, reasonably Do good. Well. Yeah. And configure and verify, uh, less so. 
Oh, that's good. Yeah, but, but, but what is a bit confusing is that here, this is not the section. So these are sections, but this is not because there's package and there's monitor and there's configure. Uh, oh, so yeah. I, I need, yeah, one. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is, that with a, is that a data issue? Uh, no, I'm trying to figure out what these things are called because you've got the sections and the stage in the group, but these ones are stages. I oh, think. right. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but this is the groups in the stage in the section, and this is just yeah, all sections. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, we, I think. I which think is a should... bit. Yeah. Sorry, Bob. Like, uh, because right now you've done that manually, which. Uh, which, what's the section for these stages? And we have the stages on the on the metrics that you're using there, but we don't have the section. I think we should start adding the sections like way in the beginning in our mapping, then that would roll up here and it wouldn't be manual work for you. And it also means if a group, if a stage move, moves between sections, it's the same as if a feature category moves between groups or a group between, between stages, the historical data would also be right. Um, because it would be at the, the point we collect the data. Yeah, I think that I think that would be helpful. Um, but also, what I want to do is wait till we get feedback on this because sure. we've spent quite a lot of time just being able to create these things. And the view, while we understand what this view does, we might find that this isn't what the product managers were hoping to see. So I want to get the feedback from them and then see how much more work we're going to put into this now. Um, but I definitely agree if we had that, that section information available sooner, it would definitely make this, this easier. I just don't know if we need to add that in right now. Mm -hmm. Another organizational design thing that this makes me wonder about is we've, we've got a lot of um, people in fulfillment and growth. Um, but those groups, stages, whatever, don't really own endpoints. What they do is they add things to other teams endpoints a lot of the time. Um, so their impact doesn't really show up here directly. Um, uh, but without the V2 SLI proposal or something similar, we couldn't, we couldn't really tease that out. Um, so yeah, I'm just calling that out there because like, I, uh, I don't even think with the with the SLI two proposal that that would be necessarily addressed. Uh, some of these, some of these would also be addressed because the so like for example fulfillment which has the purchase group and whatnot does run services on our intro like we run services right. for That's them true. that we don't really yeah. have SLIs for so I don't know um, yeah enablement might be yeah I guess, I, guess I was thinking more but, growth because um yeah that's the one where it tends to be like we're going to add an experiment to this page that's actually owned by this group um. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so enablement is memory, database, distribution. Yeah, global of search. I, I was thinking it would be cool if we could define, like the way we define SLIs for services in like a fancy JSON thing, and have groups define their own SLIs like that, like so they add metrics for themselves and then for for example for them the growth that there's doing a lot of tracking and experiments and stuff they could define an sli based on that but could we not just put that in the in the normal services because those are going to be in like the web or api or whatever and we just have an sli in there with the feature category on it that's what i what i've been pointing people at now like for pages and so on that's a good idea yeah. Still need to add validation for those feature categories. Well, that was all I wanted to share on that. Um, is there anything else anyone would like to share? If if people are really bored and um, at all interested, I can I can go into a little bit of detail of the pain that I've been experiencing over the last few days, but you probably don't want to know about about Python dependency management and timeland. Show me. It it it's a it's a state. So, is it is it is it more painful than cookbooks? Uh, 
Well, what I know about Facebook probably not. Is you have, like, you have options, whereas like, I don't know. languages you have, this is what you use for dependency management, whereas in Python it tends to be like, you could use this yeah. or you could use that. Um, so, yeah. It's... So what, this is this these are the things I've learned. So obviously I'm uh, kind of new to all of this um, because I'm not really a Python developer. But one of the things that I've noticed is that very often um, we'll push a change in Tamland. We'll push a change to like GitLab CI, and that will kick off a new Docker image build. And we because the Python is basically the effective gem install bundle install. For Python takes such a long time. We break that all into the into the image, and every time we break that image, like various different things break. And at the moment, there's like a whole bunch of um, like logging messages that have just started appearing because we happen to build a new container image, and it's super sketchy and it's not very stable. And so I was quite. I thought, well, this will be a really easy small fix. Let's lock the dependencies that we use. So that whenever we rebuild that we can we can have some consistency like this this is going to be easy right like this will be like a little five minute task to add a, a lock file to our conda so just to give you an example of what it looks like um this is this is what the conda file looks like and actually in the before all of these changes they had like full version numbers in them um but the problem is that the actual dependency tree is much much bigger than this and there isn't a way of um generating the like a lock file um but what you can do that i discovered is you can you can basically take the current set of 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 gems or, or pips whatever python you know the, the python dependencies and you can take a snapshot of that and so what i did was i i installed from this file and then i write it out to this file here and um this is this has been a Wait, total nightmare. You built that. I yeah 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 because I couldn't find anything to to do it. So this is the first thing I googled and googled and googled, and it just doesn't seem to be like a thing. So there's a different thing called poetry. There's pip is obviously the main Python thing, and then poetry a, seems to have txt right. That's not this one. That's that's pip. So pip okay. uses requirements txt. Um, but but the problem with pip is that. The build for pip basically builds everything from source. And so the build takes like several hours. Um, and so Anaconda, it's got um, all of these packages that are like sort of pre-compiled for different environments. And they are sort of community looking after them and making sure that they work and they designed for all the data science stuff. And that's why we ended up with Anaconda, especially because there's pre-compiled binaries for a lot of the stuff. And, you know, like um, PyStan, you know, there's this massive um, Monte Carlo simulation library. And when you start trying to do a build on that, it, it takes hours and hours and hours. So you definitely want to use like prepackaged um, things. So I started building up. Uh, the first thing I discovered was that the, the packages that are available for, because uh, Conda understands, you know, it uses these pre-compiled binaries. Um, the first thing I read, realized was that binary versions that are available for OS X and Linux are different, right? And so you might say, I'm going to use PyStan and PyStan uses lib Fortran G. Um, and it's because on OS X, there's lib Fortran G5. So it'll use lib Fortran G5. And if you try and then uh, install that on Linux, it's like there's no lib Fortran G5. So the next thing I started doing was going around and adding all of these like hard coded dependencies to my sort of source file. Like we can't use five because it, you know, blah, 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 long story. Uh, and so that was my first attempt at doing this. Um, the second problem, or there's, there's been a lot of problems, but basically where I'm at now is that I've pretty much, uh, oh, and then the second problem that I've just hit is that there's a whole bunch of stuff in the dependency tree that is that you don't even get for other environments. And so there's a thing that I just removed from here called app nope. And, uh, and basically, when I tried to install that on Linux, it said it couldn't be found. I went to Anaconda, looked it up, and there's, there's only app nope for, for, for Mac OS. So I tried to figure out what it is. 
and it's something that stops Mac OS from sleeping. So there's never going to be a similar thing for, <laughs> for Linux. And, and so the first thing I started doing was like, well, should I do grep minus Vs and remove the things? But like where I'm at now, well, right now, this was supposed to be a five minute job and it's been like a three day job. I'm tearing my hair out. Um, but we're, pardon? Like in the, there's no way you can set a platform dependency in the system. No, no, no I've, looked, I've looked for it. So where I'm at right now is that I'm going to build this in CI. I'm going to run the, the I've just started putting it together now. Um, and I'm going to generate the, um, the, the, the lock file in Linux. And then it's going to go and push a merge request with the new lock file. And, um, and then we can, and then we can go from there and on Mac OS, I don't know, we'll, you know, we can do that. I'm less worried about Mac OS. It's more the, uh, the stability of Linux that I'm, that I'm concerned about here. So, um, yeah, I'll figure that, that bit out next, but yeah, it's been a, it's been an eye opening experience and I, I can't help but wonder if I've just totally missed out on something, but it seems to be, um, you know, like, uh, here's, here's actually the dependency tree. So, you know, this is, this is what it pulled out. And the reason it's got app open there is because on, on Mac OS, IPython requires it and therefore it includes it in the list. So the only way I can do this is actually run it on, on Linux or at least inside some sort of container. So if you ever go into Tamland and see some very sort of strange practices, this is why we, this is why I did that. But I do think it's, it, 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 it feels like a tangent, but I do think it's really important because the number of times that Tamland is broken because these dependencies keep changing, um, it's becoming a problem. And um, Kong Min, I put in the first unit tests because I got sick of trying to test if things were working or not. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I just realized I do kind of have something to share, though it's not really done, but Andrew and I will. Andrew replied to my email, so I'll just quickly share what I've been doing. So this is the follow-up from the um, sidekick didn't alert because it didn't know that a cron job was failing. So part of the problem was that the counters started at uh, one because we didn't pre-initialize them. So when we first added a value to the counter, it went from this counter doesn't exist to this counter is one. Um, and so if you try and take the rate of that in Prometheus, you'll get zero. Um, so we need it to happen twice, but if it's a cron job or if it's just a job that doesn't happen very frequently, it won't, it won't ever go above one. So the rate will be lower than it should be. Uh, so that's fixed. So now um, I'm splitting out the, uh, so Andrew already did this for Gisley. So this now does it for every global, uh, sorry, Gisley because it was node level um, alerting. And now this is the global part of every service. So it's going to be quite a big diff, but what it's doing is it's saying instead of having an alert that is for the one hour and six hour windows combined, the multi window, multi burn, right? Alert. Um, we've got two separate alerts, one for each window, um, each with a label. So the diff is massive. Um, but the basic idea is for Sidekick, we'll go from an alert that looks like this to one that looks like this and one that looks like this. So uh, this is a, um, one hour alert, and this is a six hour alert. Uh, when I was testing these, these didn't actually have any data. So I changed it to give us an order of magnitude lower of a threshold. Um, and we can see that uh, we don't actually have any one hour alerts here, but we do have a six hour alert that would have fired with this. And there's no one hour alert and the six hour one, the shape on that looks the same. So that's the first step. The next step is to, um, use this to allow, again, the same as Andrew's done for Gitly, for node level alerts, instead of um, saying that this is a one hour alert, say that this is a however many samples is alert. Uh, do you remember how many samples it is, Andrew, off the top of your head? Uh, it was quite a lot higher for, um, was it 360? Yeah. Oh, I'm just yeah, but, but it, we can, we can I think we're going to use a different number. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we can configure the sample rate. Um, uh, so yeah, um, then once we have that, we can say that this psychic 
alert should fire over a three day window given, sorry, not over, yeah, over a three day window given this number of samples um, rather than given this um, rate request per second because um, it might have a very low request per second. Have you um, given some thought to the number of samples that you want to use in that, Sean? No. <laughs> um, I was going to reuse that and then I realized that 0 0.1 is way too high. Um, so yeah. the three day one is going to have to be very, very low. But then do we only want the three day one for certain workers? Because we don't, you know, oh, it's, a, it's a minimum sample rate, so it should be fine, actually. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to have a look at yeah, I can't remember if we are doing upscaling to three days already, or if that will happen automatically if you add the three day um, to the aggregation sets. Yeah, because or if there needs to be extra work there. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, because my, my only ask is that we don't do it manually. We don't have any yeah. like rate square bracket three days because it'll just melt the yeah, service. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, it'll have to be low for the cron jobs because I guess a cron job. Well, we have, I think, one weekly cron job, but most cron jobs will be once a day as a minimum. So that will probably have to be a very, 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 very low request per second to match. Yeah. One I mean, three, can we, I mean, I think three, like if we're saying three days and you've got three, that's probably too low. Like, I, I suspect that that, um, can we not make those once per day go to at least twice or three times a day is is there like like if we if we started off with like 10 samples as a minimum um and then and then reviewed what was still getting missed and then kind yeah. of on a needs basis we kind of increase those up to like so that yeah we could we could totally say like you know we expect yeah. 10 samples a day these are the workers that don't meet that threshold what do we do about those yeah. um yeah, yeah. Because three, three just feels like it's going to be noisy. Like it, it's a <laughs> yeah. super low, it's a like, super low rate. This is the problem, right? We have some cron jobs that run day or that were running daily yeah. and failing all the time that we just will never, never hear about yeah. because they only run once a day. Um, yeah. And in the error budgeting, yeah. that wouldn't show up at all because you know it's yeah. one failure. It's too low. Yeah. How much? How much can it cost, I, Michael? Yeah. <laughs> so the 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 SRE workbook their solution is increase your rps like that's that's their kind of take on that but obviously we're not going to run it like once a minute but like maybe you know several times a day rather than once a day would be yeah would be a good start yeah i mean it depends it depends what the job is as well like some of them like in the domain will have to be daily because they might be like um i think there's one that sends out emails for issues that are due the next day so, yeah, but I've noticed right. that we have a lot of these these jobs that we don't see, but that actually do something once a day, fetch a bunch of record from from the database, and then process them in the loop. And one of the suggestions I made is like make make those one one job each because it won't scale forever mm -hmm. anyway, and then that's easier to look at. Yeah, I don't know if this is a daily one, but there's definitely one that deletes unreferenced LFS objects on a cron, and that that sort of thing can. Can be like schedule a bunch of jobs to delete unreferenced LFS objects. So yeah, yeah, and that one is difficult because we don't have anything to query on the like we don't have an easy thing to query to see what we need to do. Yeah, but yeah, there's I'll, one I'll other, take a look at that. There's one other thing that we could, if it becomes a real problem, we could say that we also go with a 30 day. We measure over 30 days, and then you know, your minimum sample of 10, well, 30 over 30 days would be something that we can do, right? But that, yeah. But you'll find out quite late if it's failing yeah, all yeah, the yeah. time. But, but these are things that have not been running for, you know, a very long time. But yeah, you would, you would find out. Uh, but yeah, but maybe that's, we'll just have to see how noisy it is, I guess. And then that yeah. would be one of the things that we could possibly use. Yeah, cool. Um, I'll take a look at that and I'll pass that in. I'll back to you now that I've actually managed to commit all those changes without the, do you know what causes the, the weird thing where the Git API and web services always have a diff when you run make generate? Um, anybody else see that? No. Okay. I haven't seen that. 
Okay. The, 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 sometimes the thing with Ruby YAML, like, is it is it a white space problem or is it a actual yeah, code there's, change? There's white, if that's generated by Ruby, then it's yeah, a, it's a there. it's a Ruby YAML. Yeah, it's a yeah. yeah. I don't know why, but yeah, it's really irritating. Okay. Cool. <laughs> right. Anybody else got anything? Thanks, okay. everyone. Thanks so much, everybody.